Welcome back to another lesson on thermodynamics. In this video, we're going to talk about the ideal gas law. So let's start with the ideal gas law, which is basically an equation of state for an ideal gas. It describes how the pressure, volume, and temperature of the ideal gas are all related to each other. Meaning if you have an ideal gas with a pressure P, a volume V, and a temperature T, of course with the temperature being measured in terms of an absolute scale like Kelvin, then the relationship between P, V, and T is given by PV equals nRT. This is the equation of state for the ideal gas or the ideal gas law. I'll call this equation 1. Note that N here represents the amount of the gas in moles. Recall that a mole of a substance is the amount of that substance which contains an Avogadro's number of its molecules. Avogadro's number, or N sub A, is around 6.023 times 10 to the 23. So a mole of carbon dioxide, for instance, is 6.023 times 10 to the 23 CO2 molecules, for example. And finally, R is known as the universal gas constant, which is experimentally obtained and is about 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. Now, in statistical mechanics, we'll have to really zoom in on the molecular level to see what's going on, so in this context it's helpful to rewrite the ideal gas law in terms of the number of molecules of your substance N. And because the number of moles N is basically the total number of molecules of your substance capital N divided by Avogadro's number, you can plug this into equation 1 to rewrite your ideal gas law. Once you do that, you get the following equation. You can then introduce a new constant K, defined as the universal gas constant R divided by Avogadro's number. When you do the calculation, you get a value of about 1.381 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin. This, by the way, is known as the Boltzmann constant. Just bear in mind that the ideal gas law is an approximation in the end. Real gases like oxygen, carbon dioxide, etc. aren't actually ideal gases. They become less and less ideal as you approach cooler temperatures because their volume doesn't actually become zero as capital T approaches zero. The attractive forces between those molecules also become more pronounced at lower temperatures, which throws another wrench into our ideal gas approximation, which assumes no attractive forces between molecules. But equation one is still a good approximation at higher temperatures when the space between molecules is sufficient large. So ultimately, in terms of the number of molecules and the Boltzmann constant, the ideal gas law becomes PV equals capital NKT. Now let's look at a microscopic model of an ideal gas by examining the behavior of a single particle. Let's say that we have a single ideal gas molecule in a cylindrical container with a volume V, cross-sectional area A, and length L. The cylindrical container has a piston at the end like so, which is responsible for the pressure being put on our system. Of course, the volume V is just capital A times L. We'll suppose that at time zero, the molecule has a velocity V given by this vector. Let's also suppose that when the molecule collides with the wall of the container, the collision is elastic, meaning that the molecule doesn't lose kinetic energy with the collision. Since the mass of the molecule is obviously conserved, this means that the molecule speed, or velocity magnitude, remains constant with each collision. And lastly, we'll assume that the walls of the container are perfectly smooth so that the molecule bounces off at the same angle it struck the surface with. So with each collision, for instance, theta1 equals theta2 over here. Now, our goal is to take equation 1b, our lightly modified ideal gas law, and use that to determine the relationship between the temperature of our ideal gas molecule and its kinetic energy. This will be a two-step process. We'll first find the relationship between pressure and kinetic energy, and then we'll use equation 1b to relate that kinetic energy to temperature. So let's start with the pressure. Recall that pressure fundamentally is the force per unit area, but in this case because we have just one molecule, the only time there's pressure exerted on our piston is when the molecule actually hits the piston, so it's better to conceptualize our pressure as an average pressure over a long period of time. So the average pressure on the piston is the average force exerted on the piston by the molecule divided by the cross-sectional area A. But by Newton's third law, the force exerted by the molecule on the piston is equal and opposite to the force the piston exerts on the molecule. Now let's suppose that our average is taken over the time period it takes for the molecule to go from one end of the cylinder to the piston and then back to the end of the cylinder. 
If the horizontal velocity of the molecule is v sub x, then delta t is the time it takes to go from the left end of the piston, which is L over v sub x, plus the time it takes to return back, which is also L over v sub x. So the total delta t is 2L over v sub x. I'll call this equation 2. But what about the force exerted by the piston on the molecule, which is what we want? Well, by Newton's second law now, the average force is the change in momentum of our molecule divided by the time over which that momentum changed, so m times delta v over delta t. Now, because our collisions are elastic and because we're assuming the molecule is going straight in the horizontal direction, delta v is just 2 times v sub x, and delta t is 2l over v sub x as we showed earlier. So the average pressure then comes out to mv sub x squared over a times l, which is just mv sub x squared over the volume of the container v. This equation is important because it tells us that if our molecule is moving faster, so if the velocity is higher, then the average pressure exerted on the piston also increases. One, because the collisions become more frequent, and the other because the collisions are more violent, they're more intense. So we found the pressure for a single molecule and its relationship with kinetic energy, but what if we had capital N molecules, each with mass small m and with all distributed evenly in the cylinder with random directions of motion? Well, then the average pressure being exerted on the piston becomes the sum of the individual pressures being exerted on the piston by each of these molecules. So you sum all these individual terms together with the individual x velocities of each of these molecules. If we suppose that the number of molecules is very large, then instead of pressure constantly fluctuating instant to instant, it becomes a more continuous quantity because at any given time, there's always collisions going on with the piston and our ideal gas molecules. So we can replace the p with the bar with just regular p. The other thing we'll do is now average the squared x velocities of all our molecules by writing the sum of squares of these individual velocities as the average squared velocity v sub x squared with a bar times the number of molecules capital N. This is just straight up how you calculate a mean. You then plug this into the pressure equation and get the following. If you then plug this into the ideal gas law, the capital N's cancel out and you get m times v sub x squared bar equal to k times t. Half of this would then be half of k times t. The same logic applies to the v sub y and v sub z velocity components. And if we use the fact that the kinetic energy is half m times the sum of squares of these velocity components, we can add the half kt contributions from each of these components to conclude that the kinetic energy of our ideal gas molecule is 3 over 2 times k times capital T. I'll call this equation 3. And this equation is really important. It tells us that the temperature of an ideal gas is directly correlated with the kinetic energy of its molecules. By raising the temperature, you raise the kinetic energy of the individual molecules. But technically speaking, the assumptions behind equation 3 theoretically mean that it would not apply for a non-ideal gas or a solid or a liquid or if any one of our other assumptions breaks down like if we had inelastic collisions or forces between the gas molecules but we'll see later in the series that equation 3 holds for a number of other situations including non-ideal gases and even some solids and liquids anyway that should do it for this video i'd like to thank the following patrons for their support and if you enjoyed the lesson feel free to like and subscribe this is the faculty of khan signing out